We have just entered a period in history where anime is everywhere. You see it online, you see it in Walmart, its influence is stretching far and wide across the landscape of modern media. Hell, maybe even your friends who are into sports now think anime is cool. And the truth is, anime has always been cool, but... Well, maybe that's according to the nerd making this video, but I definitely think it's just been misunderstood by the West and even in the East. And if I were to break up each way that anime has emerged in popular media and garnered critical attention in recent years, there's a few titles that would turn heads almost everywhere. From the random kid holding a manga at the grocery store waiting for his mother to finish her shopping trip, to even a condescending grandmother who may or may not think anime is just an outlet for inappropriate desires. And while arguments on either side could be made regarding the level of degeneracy that people indulge in with anime, it's my job to say that this is not what we'll be covering in this video, and also to say humans will make almost any concept weird if they have enough time and resources to do so. But putting that all aside, let's focus on the topic at hand. So in order to understand the influence of Urusei Yatsura, the series we're talking about today, we'll need to focus on a time in Japan often referred to as the first golden age of anime. A decade which you'll see was a very different one from today's selection, yet offered some very famous series, many of which are still running. In any case, put down your phones and pick up your Walkmans, get out your turntables, City Pop albums, and Famicoms, because we're going back, folks, way back to 1980s Japan. Now, to understand what an influential time the 80s was for Japan as a whole, you'd have to look no further than the economic boom as well as the emerging entertainment industries during the decade. In the 1980s, the Japanese yen was easy to come by, the economy gaining an average of 3.89% in terms of GDP annually, putting them ahead of the US and most of the world. This meant that morale was relatively high, and there was plenty of money to go around as unemployment rates fell to just under 5%, according to a few sources. And this was ever present in the games, anime, and manga industries as well. Nintendo was raking in funds from the success of their games like Super Mario Bros. and console hardware, fueling new projects in years to come. Meanwhile, Hayao Miyazaki, Toshio Suzuki, and Isao Takahata were making history with Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, The Grave of the Fireflies, and a bunch of other IPs that would change the way the Western world viewed anime. Oh, and then there was Akira. There's not much to say that hasn't already been said about Akira's impact on the world, or the incredible amount of work and dedication that went into this series. But this along with all the other things I just mentioned made the 80s one of the most culturally influential decades in Japan's modern history. And even now, a resurgence of fans has grown, eager to put on their favorite city pop album with every chance they get. This is where my Yurusei Yatsura journey began a few years back. YouTube recommended me a video about six or seven years ago, and from then on, City Pop and 1980s Japan has lived in my mind ever since. And if you're wondering, this video was the one I'm going to show up on the screen right now. And I guess at the time, I just thought that the characters in the video were just from some old anime, and I didn't pay them much mind. It was only later that year when I went to an anime convention, and I kept seeing this girl with the bikini and the go-go boots everywhere, that I went up to a guy and I was like, who the heck is that? And he looked at me and he replied, oh, her? Well, that's Loom from Urusei Yatsura. And that was the first of many times that I would see Loom. The thing is, if you search up 80s anime or manga on Google, you'll see a list of definitive series from that time. One of which is none other than, you guessed it, Urusei Yatsura. Now, when you dig beneath all of the Dragon Balls and the Attack on Titans and the Ghosts in the Shells and every other really popular IP, this one seems to be less talked about today. However, one thing I've found is that you can't seem to bring up Japan in the 80s without Luminataro popping out from somewhere and putting themselves into the search results. So this series clearly has a following. Rumiko Takahashi, the author, is one of the best-selling and most celebrated in anime and manga history. And this is where she got her big break. And of course, folks, that's what we're really here to talk about. 
So let's begin by discussing how it all started with this series. Now before we plunge fully into the 80s again, we have to wind the clock a little bit back to 1976. This was an important year for Rumiko Takahashi. After spending much of her childhood drawing manga and publishing her work in her school newspaper, Takahashi brought this love of comics with her into college, but only as a hobby at first. For her, the choice between becoming a mangaka full-time and continuing on her academic journey was not entirely clear. At the time, Japan's manga industry was dominantly male, and not sure how the community would receive her, Takahashi made the decision to keep drawing manga as a side hobby, as we now know this would not last. Passing her entrance exams and earning a spot in Nihon Jose Dai, a women's college, Takahashi began taking evening classes at Gakiga Sonjuku, a manga school run by well-known mangaka Kazuo Koike who created titles such as Lone Wolf and Cub and Lady Snowblood. With his guidance, Takahashi became even more serious about her work, leaning into Koike's teachings which stressed good characterization within one's story. In other words, breaking character tropes and making your characters human rather than just black and white in personality or meant to push one specific trait or genre. If a character was to be present, they would have to add a unique perspective to the event or the narrative. They'd have to have a reason to be there. Takahashi continued to work under Koike for two years, growing her portfolio of manga and short stories she published for the Japan Women's University Manga Club. And earlier, when I alluded to 1976 being an important year for Takahashi, this is exactly what I meant. Over the next year, her manga grew popular, and before she knew it, dreams of becoming a full-time mangaka re-emerged with a newfound intensity. Still, in addition to the manga industry being largely male, it also leaned in favor of younger authors. If Takahashi wanted to be taken seriously as an asset to the business, she would have to become fully published in a magazine within the next few years before she was too old to be considered a quote-unquote fresh candidate. Fearing for her future, her parents tried to coax her away from the unconventional path she was entering, but Rumiko knew if she had seen success in her small publications, then the promise lay out in the world of the national manga market. And as it turns out, she was right. At the time, new authors considered legends today were just getting their starts, and Rumiko joined them as an eager mangaka in 1977. Shoga Kukon, a massive publisher, was impressed with her work, offering her a slot in their weekly Shonen Sunday magazine. What resulted was a small serialized manga by the name of Those Selfish Aliens, and it's a fun one about a boy being kidnapped by aliens. Not so fun for him, granted, but fun for the viewers. And of course, you can see how Rumiko Takahashi took this fresh concept and made it into something which would eventually become bigger and more influential than anyone could have possibly imagined. And this came in the form of her next project, Urusei Yatsura. At this point, it was 1978, arguably the most pivotal point in Takahashi's early career that solidified her future as the author we know today. But below the surface, things weren't exactly easy. Now, it's no secret that the manga and anime industry is infamous in the way they treat their creators. Authors are pushed to the limit on weekly publication schedules, and adding to that stress is Japan's notoriously feverish work ethic and demand to strive to perfection and never make any mistakes. And for Rumiko Takahashi, this was not easy. Others have spoken about it since, but in 1978, the industry was more of a national brand than a global one, and Japan had not yet started tackling the mental and physical health of its many workers. And so what it came down to was how much you could take, and Rumiko worked tirelessly alongside other writers to ensure her new comic would work out. The success of Those Selfish Aliens had earned her a new artist award, and after being granted a regular serialization in Weekly Shonen Sunday, the first chapter of Urusei Yatsura was published on September 24, 1978. 
1978. What would come would bring a new cultural icon to Japanese media and grow as an IP overseas, and this had all started when Takahashi was just 20 years old. Now similar to her previous title, Rumiko Takahashi kept with a supernatural twist. This was to be a weekly comic about a guy named Ataru Moroboshi, his girlfriend Shinobu, and an annoying monk Sakuranbo aka Cherry. Oh, and then there was this race where aliens invaded Earth and Atari had to catch touch the horns of Girl to win, the girl being the beautiful alien loom. Now, the stage was set. Ataru was the main character going through these wacky misadventures all the time, from switching bodies to chasing girls to being zapped to death like six times or more. And in the beginning, Urusei Yatsura was drawn by Takahashi and her two assistants, who all lived in a tiny, extremely cramped 150 square foot apartment, tacked full of empty ramen cartons, books, and art supplies. In fact, to save space, Takahashi herself slept in the closet, so it's clear to see that this manga had humble beginnings. Despite her best efforts, Rumiko couldn't get the first issues out fast enough. With each new story packed with detail and all hand drawn, Urusei Yatsura would publish sporadically for the first year. However, through 1979, she was able to establish a good pace for her manga workflow, and thus, by 1980, the series was becoming more streamlined and now releasing on a weekly basis, with each new issue bringing another original story to the front. And at this point, it had been two years since Urusei Yatsura had begun, the series evolving drastically from the original concepts. While Ataru was still the main character, Loom had outgrown her background character designation to become a mainstay of the series, added with a large list of side characters, all unique and with their own distinct personalities, Urusei Yatsura was finding its place. It was a series that appealed largely to college students, and Rumiko, being the age herself, found it easy to create the stories centered around quirky people, young and old. At the same time, she took inspiration from her cramped living situation and began another publication, Meisou Nikoku, about a student living in a wacky tenant situation caught in a love triangle. This was to be her most realistic series and one of her most successful. A reminder, she was doing this while still serializing Urusei Yatsura. In a word, Rumika Takahashi was one busy woman in 1980. While Meisou Nikoku came monthly, Urusei Yatsura continued to be published weekly. From there, things began ramping up even more. In 1981, three years into her career, Kitty Films picked up Urusei Yatsura for an anime adaption and with director Mamoru Oshii at the helm. He would go on to direct Pat Labor and Ghost in the Shell, among other things. So it's clear to see at this point that the 1980s was hungry for more manga and anime, and Takahashi was there to deliver. Over the next few years, she would see Loom become a household name as Urusei Yatsura ran for five years from 1981 to 1986 in its anime adaption, and beyond its original 195 episodes, got an additional four movies made. Since then, two more movies have been released along with the bundle of OVA spanning over a decade, and on January 1st, 2022, a new adaption was announced which I am honestly quite excited for. I will be sitting down momentarily and watching that and letting you know my thoughts. And with this in mind, let's move on to what made this series work as a whole. Now, one of the reasons I think Urusei Yatsura succeeded so well was because of its well-balanced story structure. It's ultimately what raised this series so far up above others at the time, in popularity and allowed it to stay fresh and relevant for its nine year run and beyond. Now, I've already touched upon this, but for the Japanese people, free time isn't something they are granted a lot of young or old. So for a student, the reality of being able to escape into the world of manga and anime was a big deal because it took them to a place where castles floated in the sky, money wasn't an object, and societal expectations just really didn't matter. And with Weekly Shonen Sunday or Shonen Jump or any of these publications, a person could rely on the stories to be an outlet for their anxiety. And so a comic like Urusei Yatsura took this school worry, this homework pressure, and essentially threw it out the window and replaced it with pure fun and entertainment. 
And this manga did it so effectively because of its weekly resetting storylines. Now, Urusei Yatsura is broken up into 374 individual chapters. And the great thing is that while there are overarching storylines, these don't change the fact that at pretty much any point in the story, you can just jump in without prior knowledge and enjoy the mini plots almost as much as someone who's been reading the entire series. And this is achieved by having a consistent cast of characters who act in similar ways most chapters. So you never feel like you have to play catch up. Rather, chapter 1 of the story and chapter 48, or 50, or 75 could be read without much confusion. And this helped for people having to wait a week to read the new issues, or anyone new to the magazine. They didn't have to remember existing conflicts from last week's issue. Instead, they could just jump right into the new chapter without thinking. Now, this concept is not new. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was doing it with Sherlock Holmes way back in the Victorian age, and you can see how these iconic stories continue to live vibrantly in modern pop culture today. So what Urusei Yatsura did was take this proven method and tweak it to fit the needs of Weekly Shonen Sunday and Luminataro's absurd version of Japan. And it worked, propelling the comic into popularity in the 1980s as a refreshing departure from the stark contrast of darker series at the time, like Hajime no Ippo and Fist of the North Star. Now this brings us to the characters, and I won't go over all of them because I don't want this video to be like 9 hours long, but also because I think just by knowing the main few characters, a person can get the sense of how much interest and nuance goes into setting these individuals apart from one another. Anyway, without further ado, let's get right into it. First, I'll talk about Ataru. Ataru is, well, kind of an asshole. He's a fickle, lecherous prick who preys on women and constantly treats Loom like a flaming pile of... Yeah. And, of course, in most other shows, you'd probably hate this guy and refuse to read any further. Granted, you have good reason considering even his parents see him for the fucking loser he is and the creepy pervert side of him just keeps showing up. But, despite all this, people don't really seem to hate him. And I don't hate Ataru either. In fact, I actually don't mind Ataru underneath all his problems. And that's because he's human. Remember when I said that Takahashi always strived to make her characters layered, unique, and realistic within the bounds of their world? Well, Ataru is all of that. Flawed as he is, the guy's human. He's got good traits, and deep down, he actually does care about people, including Loom, even if he's too much of a frickin' sundere to say it. And yes, an argument could be made that he and Loom are pretty even, considering all the times she's physically beaten or shocked him and all the times he's yelled and cheated on her. But as I'll get into later, this does change a lot, and eventually it isn't such a one-sided affection. And the thing I love about Urusei Yatsura as a series is that you can see unique personalities like this in many of the other characters through Takahashi's storytelling. Cherry is a meddlesome weirdo who seems aware of the fact others are annoyed by him and constantly switches between misguided monk and that one guy you hate who just won't go away, while like the other characters also being virtually indestructible. Sakura is a cold but sometimes concerned woman who is one of the most quote unquote normal in the cast, contrasted by a large binge eating disorder as well as being related to Cherry and being a priestess. Shinobu is Ataru's old flame who eventually matures and looks for love elsewhere. She is intelligent, extremely hot-headed, and quite taken to emotional moments. Oh, and she keeps choosing the wrong men in the series. Not that I blame her, most of these guys suck anyway. Mendo is a self-righteous rich prick, although he acts a bit more refined than Ataru, and he's rich, so that's a plus, maybe? Let me know in the comments. Anyway, he's one of the most normal students in the cast, and he does show good sides once in a while. Ran is... worst girl. Sorry, but also kinda not sorry, cause she's just nuts. Let me see. She's an alien like Loom, she uses her kindness to manipulate others, she's in love with Ray, the only true simpleton in the cast, and yeah, she never learned how to dissolve grudges, which is constantly apparent from every comic she's in. Ten is like a normal version of Ataru mixed with Mendo. 
He's got the self-righteous side down, but also is a bit lecherous and uses his status as cute baby person to manipulate the people around him, except for Ataru. Anyway, he's not so bad. I like his little rivalry with Ataru. Both win and lose. It's cute in a way. And Ryanosuke is a more serious character in the cast. Held in a rough upbringing with a terribly explosive and abusive father who won't accept her as a woman, instead insisting she's a man and teaching her to be like one. Despite his influences reflecting in her uptight attitude and being able to effectively beat up her idiot male classmates, she holds a desire to be able to express her feminine side. I really like this because it shows the complexity of a person caught in a difficult situation and trying to break free of that by being true to themselves. It's a nice bit of relevance among all the irreverence. And though not all of Ryunosuke's gags land and some stuff has aged pretty poorly, like everyone's reaction to her interest in women, it can't be said enough that these themes would go on to be explored more in Takahashi's later series, Ranma Half, and expanded on a bit here as well. But yeah, Ryunosuke is a good addition and adds a bit more of that Urusei drama to the mix. And full circle, this brings us back to Loom. Now, Loom has of course become an icon in herself, far ascending her own series' success and being recognized as a symbol of Japanese culture in the 1980s. But when you peel back all the layers, Loom starts out as a sexy, cartoonish ogre girl in Chapter 1, flying around in a tiger-striped bikini and shocking Ataru whenever he tries to do anything that doesn't involve her. But gradually, her character develops, she gets more time away from Ataru, she matures, and as such, becomes more of an emotionally grown character. Loom is much different in Volume 1 than in Volume 6 or 8 or any of the later ones because of how much more of a personality she has going forward. I think she's definitely the face of the manga itself. Ataru might be the main character, but it was Loom that brought the series up and really boosted it for me and for many others. She seemed very black and white at the beginning, and though the other characters in the series all developed and matured as well, Loom takes the cake as far as the girl who grew the most. But Loom's no perfect partner either. As I mentioned before, she has a terrible temper, is straight up lethal with her electrical attacks, and very jealous. Overall, Loom's defining trait to me, however, is her undying faithfulness and love for Ataru. And even though their relationship's got some problems and is honestly pretty toxic, I think we can all enjoy it for what it is in the manga as long as nobody actually tries to model their real life relationship anything like this one. In a manga form though, it works here for one main reason, it's really entertaining. And Loom's faithfulness is incredibly heartwarming. And above all else, that's what I'm going to think of when I see her character. I guess what I'm saying is none of the characters I've mentioned are good or bad people. They're just people. And depending on the situation, many of them play the villain or the hero in a given chapter arc, and are all obnoxious and endearing in their own way. The cast of Urusei Yatsura is complex but not overwritten, and reliable in their behavior so that you remember each character and their main traits. This definitely would have helped when you consider people had to wait a week, like I mentioned before, to read each chapter back in the 1980s. They'd remember all of the characters. But in the end, I do think Rumiko Takahashi accomplished what Koike inspired her to do. Create a story with unique characters that acted realistically within the bounds of their respective worlds. And with that, I move on to the artwork. I'm just going to take a few scenes from the manga that I remember well because of the art in them, but truth be told, you could take almost any page from this manga, and you would be greeted with an extremely lush and intricate layout. And just look at the detail. I grew up reading more modern and currently popular titles as a kid, but what I was missing with some of those series was the care and attention that Takahashi and her assistants have poured into the artwork here. What Urusei Yatsura does is it maximizes its real estate on each page with wonderful artwork. I mean, just look at these tiny little panels, packed with expression. And to assist in this, the layout stays relatively simple so that these drawings never feel confusing, having a natural flow that the reader's eyes can follow up and down each page. Without a doubt, when I see this, I see more than just meeting a deadline every week. I see someone devoted to their work. I see passion. 
and passion is what elevated this series to new heights, helping to inspire a whole new generation of readers, myself included. Now to understand the main reason that this series became so popular is to acknowledge how many hundreds to thousands of series have copied or borrowed from its ideas over the years. And to best illustrate what I mean, I'm going to break down Urusei Yatsura into a few simple elements that show up consistently throughout each issue released. Number one is a protagonist, typically a male. Then comes in element number two, a girl who holds a love interest towards said guy who doesn't return the sentiment for whatever reason. Maybe it's because he's stupid, maybe it's because he's unaware, which I guess is the same thing as saying he's stupid. Anyway, moving on. Number three is a childhood friend who has a certain relationship with the main character, resulting in a love triangle. Now, Urusei Yatsura wasn't the first to do this, but it was one of the most notable early examples of a story which used these elements. And as the years turned into decades, creators would take these concepts of Urusei Yatsura and reuse and recycle them, until they became tropes themselves. And this occurred particularly in harem anime. Now, harem anime is essentially anyone's sexual or romantic fantasy that happened to grow a writing staff and found its way into anime or manga form. And I'm certainly not trying to be dismissive of the genre. Hell, I have many fond memories of being a kid and watching series like To Love Rue and Rosario Vampire in my formative years. And I even drew a 150 page manga of my own from 7th to 10th grade that was directly inspired by a few I had watched. Funny thing is though, I didn't really know at the time that this all tied back to the impact that Urusei Yatsura had on establishing these tropes by introducing them in a palatable way that proved successful with audiences and sales figures. And to show you what I mean, I'm going to lay out a few series that you might recognize the plot lines of in regards to what we've been talking about in this video. To Love Rue centers around a guy meeting an alien girl and being caught in a love triangle. My Bride is a Mermaid centers around, well, a guy forced to marry a mermaid while liking another girl, causing a love triangle. Outlanders is about a guy who gets forced into an engagement with an alien girl. There's probably a love triangle there somewhere too if you look hard enough. Infinite Stratos features a love triangle, guess what, and stars this idiot. Now you know, I think we've seen enough. In any case, these are just a few of the hundreds if not thousands of series that have taken inspiration from Takahashi's works. Anime with some Dede characters, harem anime, the childhood friend, the love triangle, that popular guy the girls all love and the guys all hate, anime where they break the fourth wall and the magic girlfriend are just a few of the tropes that were popularized by Urusei Yatsura. Creators took a lot of inspiration from Luminar Band of Misfits, and it's really neat to see that even with the complexity of the characters Takahashi creates, she can still arrange them in a relatively simple, understandable, palatable and entertaining story that resets each week. And like I stated earlier, she wasn't necessarily the first to invent all these concepts, but definitely the one to make them famous and prove successful in decades to come. Since then, we've seen these tropes reintroduced and spread way beyond harem anime. We've seen it in tons of rom-coms, series, isekais, comedies, and a ton of other shows across modern media, even to genres you might not expect to have them, or to mediums beyond anime. And it's funny to think it all spawned from a weekly comic about a guy and his alien girlfriend. Now, in the years following Urusei Yatsura's original publication, Rumiko Takahashi would continue to release manga, building on an already prolific career with some of her biggest titles yet. Meisoni Koku was adapted into an anime, Ron Mahaff would see a gender-swapping samurai story and a relatively successful anime adaption span until the manga's conclusion in 1996. This series largely popularized the gender-swapping trope in anime, which has since been used in hundreds of shows, including Your Name and Kokoro Connect, among many others. During Ron Mahaff, she was working on Mermaid Saga and One Pound Gospel as well, which featured many stories away from her larger works. 
In the 90s, however, Japan's economy had crashed, and between this and other factors, the lost decade of the country brought a close to Kitty Films, the studio that had adapted Takahashi's works over the previous 15 years. Rumiko's other anime adaptions would be handled by Sunrise thereafter, among other studios. In 1996, having wrapped up Ranma Half and desiring to go in a new direction, Rumiko shifted her ideas to a much darker tone of story, resulting in a new series, Inuyasha. Inuyasha follows a group as they travel across Japan to restore a sacred jewel before it falls into the wrong hands. And Inuyasha went on to get multiple anime adaptions and sell millions of copies, the manga getting a final conclusion in 2008 and becoming the most celebrated series of Takahashi's to date. It further inspired a generation of fans, appealing to the modern fan base growing in the West. Even today, I'll walk into a store and see Inuyasha printed on a t-shirt sometimes. I'll search up anime from the 80s or look up Japanese cultural character icons, and Loom will pop up. And though not everyone will know the work Takahashi has done, the sales figures don't lie. She has outdone herself in terms of creating an unparalleled body of work and so many stories that people can enjoy and have. Even now, she continues to work on manga almost every day, and that is such a great thing, to see a person devote their life to entertaining and putting a smile on the face of millions. And as one of those millions of people, I can't wait to see what the future will bring. And yeah, at the end of the day, this all comes down to some random guy who made this video because he just loves this quirky, absurd little manga. And flipping through the pages, I can read these stories for hours because of the care and attention that's been put into them. This series inspired an entire generation and continues to do so today, meaning that its reputation has become as powerful as the story itself, surpassing any original expectation that it had when it first saw publication in 1978. And so, at the end of the day, the series has inspired countless things and solidified itself in history. And there's no better way to sum it up than to say that this was the influence of Takahashi and the impact of Urusei Yatsura, a series that is all parts equally stupid at times, hilarious, and of course, beautiful. This has been how Urusei Yatsura changed anime. And with that, it's time to wrap up this video. Thanks so much for sticking it through, I really appreciate it. I know this one was a pretty long video, but when you're passionate about something, well, sometimes it's hard to stop talking about it. Anyway, let me know as always what you think of this series or any work of Takahashi. I'd love to hear about it in the comments. But thanks again for your support, and I'll see you all in the next video.